It's your girl Aisha aka Geek XX Chic and I'm back with another review of The Walking Dead. This review is for the latest episode which was called uh, The Lost and the Plunderers, episode 10. And um, yeah, I didn't really expect this to be an upper of an episode. <laughs> I think we're kind of past that point. The first few episodes, watching Rick and his crew gain ground with this war and seemingly, you know, the plan was all coming together. That was kind of our upswing, but we are definitely back down into the bowels of uh, of the sadder things about this uh, this season again. And like I said in the reaction, you know, the 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 uh, last week's episode was a real downer. We all knew it was going to be because of you know the. The goodbye to Carl. This one really wasn't too much of an upper. We're still dealing with the aftermath and we still very much focused on Rick and Michonne. Um, there was a lot of, um, there's a lot of good things as far as character development in this particular episode. Did we move things really too much with the war? I'd say probably not. And I do feel like a lot of people are probably going to have some critiques about that. As far as, you know, like, where is this really going? We've kind of stalled out here a bit as far as the war. But there were some really interesting things character-wise that I think are worth delving into. So uh, let's get into it. So we'll start with, I guess, what we saw as far as characters. Um, Michonne. My favorite character. Oh, my poor girl. Um, what I saw, at least the message that I got from what we saw with Michonne with looking at Rick with looking at the grave with looking at Alexandria everything she was kind of going through you know she's like Rick in the sense of that she's lost someone before and in particular she's lost her child like she knows exactly what Rick is going through she lost Andre and even though she's never shared that with Rick which is something that I really hope at some point these two talk about because I feel like you know, when it gets to the nitty gritty of it, I think Rick's going to need that common ground with someone. But, but if we think about, you know, her going through this again, but this time, you know, with Carl, who was older, who she could converse with. I mean, obviously losing her son was absolutely devastating. But there's a, there is a difference between losing someone who you were just starting to get to know as a person, even though they are your child, versus, you know, a child that you've been able to talk to and get to know and and kind of build that deeper uh, level of relationship with like she did with Carl and so you know I think when I saw those panning shots of Alexandria of her seeing you know the gazebo on fires her seeing you know these houses burned down her seeing it up in smoke seeing all these walkers coming through the street making it look like every other desolated place that they've come and gone through up until this point I couldn't help but think back to season five when Michonne first showed up with, with Rick and the group while she fought with Rick. If you remember, it was the first time we ever saw her actively stand up to Rick and be like, no, like I'm overriding you. I'm, I'm, I'm putting up my veto vote on what you want to do. We need to go to this Alexandria place. We need to figure out a different way to be because we're living like savages out here. And, um, you know, when she came into Alexandria, the first thing she said when they're outside the gates, do you hear that, Rick? It's children playing. You know, we, we, see, we hear sounds like we used to hear of, you know, things that indicate peace and feeling safe and a, a sense of feeling uh, human again. And, um, you know, when she came in and she looked around and she saw those houses and everything from Michonne. And we saw her say this to uh, Deanna before she died. Right. Alexandria was a symbol for Michonne of a, of a future despite all the pain and the loss and all the anguish she'd gone through at that point to get there. And that was huge for Michonne, right? Because we know that she wandered for all that time after she lost her family, you know, two walkers, you know, on her on chains behind her, just this wall, right? This just shell of a human person um, just moving around because she just thought there was nothing left to look forward to. It was survival day to day, but Alexandria was the first time she really started to think, okay, here's a future. Here's a future with this great little boy. Um, here's a future with this beautiful little girl. Here's a future with this man who eventually became my lover, right? Like all these things, you know, Michonne really believed in that. That's what kind of kept her driving. That's why she was fighting really more than anything with this Negan thing was that she's like, no, this is, I, I, I want this future where I get to live happily ever after, so to speak, with my family. And 
to see it up in flames, to see it burning, to see it desolate, to see, you know, all these things that just kind of were a shocking reminder of what the rest of the world is like, you know, that on top of losing this beautiful little boy, he's not a little boy, he's a grown man, but you get what I'm saying. Like to her, this was like, you know, the, this, this other son that she's, she came to have and then to lose this dream, the, the compound impact, you could just see it on her face. She was just so deflated. And then, you know, she she's marinating on Carl's words, Carl telling her about saying, you know, we can make it better. We don't have to keep fighting. We don't have to keep killing. We have, there has to be a better way. You remember when Carl first came to Alexandria, he wasn't ready. Remember, he was there. He was very much in the mindset of his father, right? He was keeping guns to himself. He's like, we can't trust these Alexandria people. They don't know nothing about like, like we just need to kill people. We need to kill walkers like it's all about death. So for Carl to make that big 180 turn and be where he's like, no, let's do, let's do different. Let's let me go out and find people and bring them back and let us like not fight anymore. That's a huge, huge step for Carl. And I think, you know, her, she's marinating on how all that came and then seeing this um, opposing view of everything being devastated. And she's just really struggling with how to reconcile that. And I think it's affecting, you know, her in the sense of, well, where do we even go from here now? So... That's what I kind of took from Michonne's um, piece. It was it was very, you know, seeing her with the fire extinguisher trying to save that gazebo where all those memories, those happy memories that she'd finally formed in this terrible world had happened. See that burn that was so symbolic of kind of her, maybe a piece, pardon me, a piece of her hope, a little bit of her dreams kind of going up in smoke in that moment. But very symbolic with Michonne, very sad. And, you know, of course, as usual, just beautifully acted with Denai, very nuanced. And, you know, just seeing those little moments, like even though Rashon wasn't affectionate, you know, particularly affectionate this episode, which I think is going to be a long ways off with all that's going on. But the fact that they still had each other's backs, you know, that she's still watching Rick. You can tell she's making sure he's OK. And then with the whole gazebo thing, you know, Rick, even though he clearly probably didn't give a damn about the gazebo in that moment, the fact that it mattered to her meant he was going to grab that extinguisher and try to put out this fire that I think he damn well knew wasn't going to get extinguished. But he knew she would be happier if she at least tried, you know? So I love seeing them work as a unit like this, as a Rashon chipper. It's just beautiful to see them still in that sink, even though they're both clearly spiraling in their own ways. Well, actually, let's talk about the, the, the Oceanside people really quick, because um, they're kind of the, the, the less um, deep pieces of this episode. We see that um, Enid has no regrets. You know, Enid, who was like straight up to her enemies, like, well, not enemies, but the people who at that moment wanted to kill her. She's like, no, not sorry. You know, she put me in a position where I had to shoot her and I would do it again. But the timing and the delivery of her message, you know, maybe not the best time for her to be saying right to this woman's granddaughter. Uh, yeah, suck. Too bad to be, you know, too bad for your grandma. She made me do it. Deal with it. Mm. No, Enid, actually, maybe you should try to be a little bit more empathetic. As someone who knows what it's like to lose both your parents, you know, maybe you should back up a little bit and be like, you know, I, I, I did what I thought was, was right, but I am sorry for your loss. You know what I mean? <laughs> kind of thing. But digressing, um, that whole thing felt a little weird to me because I feel like, in the one hand, I do know that the granddaughter, who I cannot remember her name at the moment, I know she was never much for just killing outsiders, right? That's why Tara escaped, because she's not about just cold-blooded murdering people the way her grandmother might have been, but... I feel like she would have at least tried to make <laughs> make Enid suffer a little bit more. On to Simon. Well, I think we all knew at some point someone in Negan's ranks was going to go off the reservation. Right? We all knew it. I mean, not everybody under, unlike Rick's group where people have joined him because they respect him or they respect his leadership or they feel a sense of loyalty to him, Negan's people are all cobbled together out of fear. Right. And so we kind of got some hints. And I think I talked about this a few episodes back that potentially Simon might have been who was running um, the, the sanctuary before Negan rose to the ranks. But um, yeah, like we, we all knew that at some point one of his generals or whatever they're called was going to be like, you know, I really don't like listening to Negan. And especially with what's happened in the last couple of like this last little attack by Rick and the group, everything since Rick's group came up you know that it's been slowly but surely kind of chiseling away at Negan's people's, the, the Savior's uh, faith in his 
ability to be Mr. Almighty. Rick has been challenging all the things that Negan said that he was capable of doing and showing that actually we're not that scared of you, sir. You know, the worst you can do is kill us sort of thing. So that whole Rick's resistance, and this is the best part about everything that's happened and kind of added a little bit of, you know, uh, it gives us a little bit of, of, of happiness and all the death and everything that's happened with Rick's group is that his resistance is actually permeating into Negan's ranks. So that's something that Negan's going to have to deal with. And we're going to talk about Negan in a bit. But um, yeah, that, you know, it, it did. It has finally put some some definite uh, dents into his armor of, of bravado. And now his generals are going to start talking amongst themselves about whether or not he really is able to keep this whole crazy show of his running and so with Simon that's clearly what happened he just got sick of it you know he uh he wasn't happy about what happened obviously at the sanctuary the fact that they could have died there and then you know he's like the garbage people he's like well we can't trust them so he's like let's just wipe them out let's kill the people we can't trust and let's just retreat and walk away from this because we're losing way too many people is it worth it for these three communities when we could go somewhere else and do this without worrying and, you know, he's somewhat at a point. So, you know, with Simon, clearly with that that uh, deteriorating trust in Negan, you know, that whole, I knew from the second Simon left, he was going to kill every single one of the people that he could. I knew it. I knew it. Um, and it wasn't even about Jadis, you know, although she is annoying as hell. Um, it was about, that was his screw you to Negan. I think the main reason we saw Simon's piece was to see that there's going to be trouble within the ranks of the sanctuary. It's coming. It's always been coming. But I think Simon might be one of the major spirit. I mean, we we saw it start with uh, Dwight, although Dwight was never really, you know, his heart was never really in it. But we saw it start with Dwight, and it's it's the the seed has been planted in the sanctuary that, you know, maybe being loyal to Negan is not always it's not a mandatory. Like maybe I don't have to listen to this guy, and that's how all things start to fall apart. And then we get into Jada's like. You know, we, we didn't see much. We've never seen a whole lot of Jadis outside of, you know, the episodes, obviously, where her and Rick have the deep interactions. But I think that the show has always done a good job of letting us know that Jadis cares about her people first, right? She wasn't all about her as a person. She was about her little garbage community. <laughs> I did feel a little bit sorry for Jadis in the sense of I know I do believe she genuinely cared about her people and she never wanted to turn out this way. But she just tried Rick on the wrong damn day. Rick is all out of, he's all out of sympathy today. <laughs> Rick, on, on this day, Jadis asked the wrong damn day for Rick to feel something in the way of sympathy for her losing her people today after he buried his son. Uh, no, it wasn't going to happen. Oh, you want to find Rick's sympathy? You need to look in the dictionary between shit and syphilis. So yeah, it was, uh, you know, I think Jadis is, we saw that because obviously I don't feel like the show just did that as a throwaway scene. Uh, I think we saw, you know, with Jadis and the grinder. Holy hell, that was gross. Yeah, we saw that with her kind of saying goodbye to that community. I think the grind. We have a lot of people just kind of saying goodbye to the status quo in this episode. And Jadis did that with the grinding of all of her people. Grotesque, yes, but symbolic. Um, she's done. I think she's now done with that. She realizes that world is kind of over now. And now it's going to be a question of who she wants revenge on more. I'm hoping she's not going to hold a grudge against Rick too hard for leaving her in there. Um, he didn't shoot her. He could have just shot her. And I think she realizes that, you know, Rick had a couple opportunities to kill her and he's never done it. But she's got real reasons to come after Negan, even though Negan didn't order this. I guess finally moving on to the, the last and probably the saddest part of all of this, which was Rick's, um, you know, perspective. It's so sad and hard to watch Rick trying to figure out how to navigate what's going on right now. There's just so much. When you really break it down to what Rick is going through, he his plan for this whole war has gone south in a handbasket, right? Like he has no idea how this all happened. He still has no idea what Tara and Daryl did to start this complete and utter cluster, right? He has to deal with the loss of Alexandria. His home is gone. A base of operations completely destroyed. He knows that pretty much all of the fighters outside of Kingdom are gone. Remember, he got that message via radio. 
that that went south in a handbasket as well, and that Ezekiel was out of commission. And then his son dies. He finds out his son is bitten and his son dies. So all of this is mounted on Rick at the same time right now. And he still has to figure out what are my next steps. Because now I got to go and tell people are looking to me as a leader as to what the hell. What do we do now? It's just so much. And you know, in his half of him, you can tell it's like, okay, well, we got to keep going. This war is not, you know, the war isn't going to pause for me to grieve. We got to keep going. You know, and, but I mean, he's keeping it together a lot better than he did when, when Lori died, but I just, my heart just went out to him. Like, this is such a crappy place for him to be in. It's just a really rough place for Rick to try to navigate. Where do I go from here? I got to keep being a leader. My heart is breaking. I need to try to be level-headed about this. Where do I go? Who do I turn to? Can I be weak right now? It's just, I, I think that, the, you know, that short amount that we got to see of Rick, we really got to see just what a ginormous pickle he is in right now and I would not pay all the money in the world <laughs> you can pay me all the money in the world I would not want to be in Rick's shoes and so um yeah I think that gives us a really good idea of where Rick is trying to step out from right now to figure out what is the next step and then he made the biggest mistake of all which is was talking to Negan in this place in this mental space right now who of course I mean I did love the moment, one of the, you know, golden moments of this episode actually for me was seeing Negan's reaction to Carl's death. Um, we knew from last season, really, that Negan's has a bit of a soft spot for Carl. And I mean, I'm very sad that the show never got a chance to explore the relationship between him and Carl, but that's a whole other discussion. But, you know, it was really kind of cool to see, you know, Jeffrey Dean Morgan played that beautifully, just that he genuinely was affected by that death, that he actually did feel sadness over that death and the fact that he needed to know if it was because of what he did um but yeah negan like a pro uses his emotional manipulation skills and turns that around to make it sound like it's all rick's fault and that was a low blow not not unsurprising for negan at all but low blow but negan's reeling but the best thing that came out of that particular scene is that it showed us as an audience that negan is reeling emotionally and mentally right now about all of this. He knows he's losing face. He knows all these defeats and all these things that have happened in the last few days and, and weeks that they're all just jabs at his credibility as a leader. Yeah, that was pretty much what I got out of this episode. Um, like I said, very much a character piece, very much about like mentality and mindsets and and probably things that are going to turn into motivating factors for the second half of the season. What did you guys think of this episode? How did you feel about seeing all these different perspectives? Do you feel like, you know, Rick's in the right for trying to just keep this war going and not taking a minute to reassess? Or do you think, you know, you're on Team Michonne on this one, thinking that maybe we should just pull back from all this and figure out if we're doing the right thing? Please leave your comments below. Let me know. I want to get in that conversation and hear what you got to say. And if you like this video, guys, please go ahead and click that like button. If you want to see more from this geeky face, please click subscribe. Until next time, see ya.